The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Karen, what's wrong? You look really wired today. I was trying to use these phones and the wires just kind of got out of hand. Yeah, wires are kind of a pain in the butt. So I was thinking we could talk about wireless today, specifically an Essentials episode about wireless technologies. What a great idea. Yeah, we can talk about the different bands of frequencies that we use in the world, what goes in each frequency, mm -hmm. how that applies to like television, radio, cell phones, etc. And then we can talk about wireless protocols themselves, like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, NFC. We could bring up examples of things that we have laying around the shop, all the modules, talk about projects we've used them in, why we use them, and then finally, discuss future project ideas that could use wireless technology. Cool, let's do it. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Let's start by going over the radio frequency bands that are commonly used in America. We'll start with ELF, or the extremely low frequency range. Lower frequencies like this are generally used for long range communication, so we get a lot of submarine use and maritime use. Just above that is our 30 to 300 hertz range. This is super low frequency, or SLF, which is still mostly maritime use, mostly. Above that, we have ultra low frequency. This is the 300 hertz to 3000 hertz range, and is also used for long range submarine communication. The lower frequencies can go further distances. Moving on from that, we arrive to the 3 kilohertz to 30 kilohertz range. This is very low frequency, or VLF. We still have mostly radio navigation and maritime military use in this range. Moving up from there, at the 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz range, we start seeing slightly more things. This is the low frequency range. We still have a lot of radio navigation, but we also get amateur radio and universal clock signals. Above that range, we have medium frequency, which makes you wonder where did normal frequency go? I guess medium is normal? Anyway, medium frequency is 300 kilohertz to three megahertz. This is where AM radio is. And then above that, we have our high frequency range, three megahertz to 30 megahertz, where we have shortwave radio, CB radio, RFID tags, radar, and more amateur radio. We're now getting into things that you've probably heard of. From here, we move on to our higher frequency bands, starting with VHF, or very high frequency. This is from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. Here we have FM radio broadcasts and TV broadcasts. Right above that is 300 megahertz to 3000 megahertz, UHF, ultra high frequency, or your favorite Weird Al Yankovic movie. This is used for TV, cell phones, and other consumer devices. Above that is super high frequency range from 3 gigahertz to 30 gigahertz, where we have yet more Wi-Fi and cellular technology, and of course, microwave transmitters. From here, we're starting to get out of the range of what normal consumers might actually use. We're talking about extremely high frequency, from 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. This is used for radio astronomy and the millimeter wave scanner, which is that thing at the airport that takes your photo under your clothes. Above that, we have the 300 gigahertz to 3000 gigahertz range. This is THF, or tremendously high frequency. This is used for crazy experimental stuff like particle physics, medical imaging, atomic blasters, and things like that. Now we're going to talk about the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz wireless range. I've heard those numbers before. Doesn't that have something to do with Wi-Fi? Yeah, uh, it's usually expressed when uh, referring to the 802.11 ABGNN wireless standards. Oh yeah, because before it was just 2.4 gigahertz and then they created another band. Mm -hmm. That's why you have dual band routers at 5 gigahertz. Right. But I, a lot of other things use 2.4 gigahertz too, like cordless phones, mm -hmm. right? Or like, like video game controllers, like the Xbox 360 controller was 2.4 yep. gigahertz wireless. Baby monitors. I've heard that's the experimental, industrial, scientific, medical range. Okay. So it's unlicensed, but it's not unregulated. Right. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to, if you want to have like sports talk radio at 1200 AM, you have to get a license for it. Mm -hmm. There's certain spectrums basically that are allowed for civilian or, you know, non-official license use, but it's still regulated. It's like you have to stay, you know, it's like you can drive down the road, but you have to stay in that lane. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it works. So we've laid out a bunch of examples of modules that we had laying around the shop that use this frequency. Yeah. Oh no, the Intel Galileo, this had <laughs> Wi-Fi? 
Um, yeah, with a module that we put on the back there. Oh yeah, you've got quite a few of these. This is a micro PCI Express, is that mm -hmm. correct? Why are there half height and full height ones? Is there a um, reason for that? Different standards for larger and smaller devices. Like This can fit a whole one, but uh, there's some devices that have a smaller form factor. Okay, that's cool. And then the latest Raspberry Pi also has wireless, right? Yep, wireless built in. Well, with all these devices using Wi-Fi, how does it fit in the spectrum? Why aren't the things bumping into each other? Well, the different protocols manage the signals from colliding. Oh yeah, I've seen that. There's an app you can get. Hold on, I think I actually have it on my phone here. Yeah, here it is. This one's really cool. It's called Wi-Fi Analyzer. Hey, there's another signal. Yeah, so what this does is it looks, it looks around and finds Wi-Fi signals, and each Wi-Fi signal has its own channel. So what you can do is you can see if your own Wi-Fi network is colliding with other channels. I mean, it'll still work if it's colliding, but the thing is, if you can change your channel number, you can move your Wi-Fi to a slightly different part of the spectrum and then have more bandwidth because you're out of the way of the other people. So it's not such a big deal here because I guess a lot, most of our neighbors don't have Wi-Fi, which is bizarre. Yeah. Um, of course, these metal walls and ceilings mm -hmm. might be hurting it, but like at home, I've tried this and it was like 10, you know, in a residential area. Yeah, there's all kinds of signals. And I'm like, oh, I'm right on top of this other guy. So I like moved it over and then I'm like, okay, now I have more space. So XP, I've heard they have a lot of different protocols that they use, but 2.4 is the most common. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, their signals are mostly proprietary. It's kind of like, uh, almost like walkie talkies, but with data. Mm -hmm. You can have one of those on either end. You can send signals pretty easily. No, um, the XB signals, they're a little bit slower than Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. and But they've got a longer range. Yeah. So of course there's always the wireless dongle that you'd stick in your laptop. Mm -hmm. That's 2.4 or five gigahertz. Uh, oh, this is, the, uh, this is the module we used in the game controller, right? Yep, the ESP8266. So this is basically Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, um, especially if you have like one of those cheap uh, TV game systems, like one thing yeah. they'll do with control Controllers is they'll they're wireless, but they'll use infrared. So that's not actually wireless in the radio sense. It's using light, right. which technically is part of the electromagnetic yes. frequency spectrum. <laughs> it's just uh, much higher. And then you know a lot of times you, you won't see antennas with these things, but we can always add antennas to get mm -hmm. better signal. For example, on our PCI card here. Oh yeah. PCI card. You know it's weird. Like we've taken apart laptops before in the show, and usually you'll find. Um, the wireless cables be strung out inside the laptop, kind of like an antenna. Well, it is an antenna, yeah. but you don't see it because it's on the inside. Right. I've noticed some things though, like this wireless module from the Xbox One S. Mm -hmm. It's got plugs for antennas, but doesn't actually use them, oh. which is weird because the older Xbox One did have antennas. Like they would string out the wires outside of the cage, obviously, so the signal can get out the metal cage. Oh, and then of course, your favorite, the Intel Edison. Yes, the Intel Edison, it has a... Uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So what are some examples of projects we've done that use this range of wireless? Um, wasn't that a mailbox project? Oh yeah, that used a pair of XBs. Yeah. Because we needed something that could go at least like a mile or two. Mm -hmm. And if you get some of the more expensive XBs, you know, the ones like 50 or $60, because yeah. these things aren't super cheap, actually. Um, I think there's one that goes up to like 10 miles, which is fairly ridiculous. But in that project, again, that used the 2.4 gigahertz wireless range, it was the idea of like, okay, my mailbox is like a mile away from me and I'm not gonna bother to go check it unless I know there's mail in there. Right. And so it would basically send a signal back, oh, I've got mail, and then that would latch in the receiver unit and then Farmer Joe would be like, oh, I got mail, I better go get my mail. We also used XP's for uh, Ms. Corbeil's controller on the uh, Hackbots project. Oh, yeah. So if you need to do like a point-to-point data transfer, XP's are a really good choice. What are some other projects we've done that use this range? The Spy Lunchbox? Oh yeah! I thought this was cool, cause like, you know, if you saw like a spy looking guy, you'd be like, oh that's a spy. But if you see some guy dressed up like, you know, like a steel mill worker, you're yeah. not, oh they're not gonna be like, oh that guy's a spy, unless he is. Cool, well this seems like a very useful range of the frequency spectrum. The next protocol we're going to talk about is Bluetooth. Now Bluetooth runs in the 2.4 gigahertz range as well, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The difference between Bluetooth and Wi-Fi is that the range is shorter mm -hmm. and the bandwidth is much less. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. You don't really transfer data over Bluetooth, but you might use it for like a mouse mm -hmm. or a headset or a stylus pen or a keyboard. I mean, all of those things transmit far less data than like, mm -hmm. you know, streaming Netflix. And say if you have a, a peripheral like a speaker or a, a pointing device, you mm -hmm. can pair them with different different uh, oh, yeah. systems. Oh yeah, yeah, that is a big difference because usually you have like a laptop and you pair a mouse to it mm -hmm. or you have a pen and you pair the pen 
to it. So you're like actually attaching Bluetooth devices to a single thing, mm -hmm. whereas wireless is more of an ad hoc network where you're talking to each other. What are some other examples? Oh, like these game controllers? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> remember the Ouya? So the Ouya was Bluetooth. The Steam controller is Bluetooth? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And then, of course, um, Felix's Super Ultra Mega Time PlayStation 4 controller. And this is Bluetooth, which allowed him to connect it to the Intel Edison when we did the Hackbots episode. So, what are these other examples we have here, Felix? Um, you have the Adafruit Feather uh, with a Bluetooth module on it. Is this like an Arduino compatible thing? Yep. Uh, charger on it. So you could create your own paired device with this. Mm -hmm. That could be a cool project. Yeah. Yeah. So Felix, what are the pros and cons of Bluetooth? Starting with the pros. Pros of Bluetooth, it's a pretty ubiquitous um, standard. There's a lot of devices. Yeah, that, everything has Bluetooth yeah. capability now. Yep. Um, there's low power consumption. Oh yeah, like with this pen. Like the battery lasts for like, what, two years or something? It's Probably. like a quadruple yeah, A battery. So what are some negatives of Bluetooth? I assume shorter distance of travel. Yeah, shorter distance of travel, not able to um, support large data transfers, couldn't sustain video transfer. It's good for audio though, but not, not for video. Um, okay. Yeah, I've never actually used uh, like a real Bluetooth headset. I had a Bluetooth thing that stuck in my ear, you know, like those people at the airport who are like talking to themselves. Yeah. I know you don't like those people. <laughs> <laughs> um, another con is uh, sometimes uh, pairing can be kind of challenging, going through all the menus, like in a car, for example. And and sometimes it, it forgets the pairing. Right. So it's like, oh, I can't see your mouse anymore. Yeah. I don't like when that happens. Oh, also, um, sometimes there's lag. Like if you turn on your laptop, there's a little bit of lag before the Bluetooth kicks in. Mm -hmm. Whereas like with a wireless mouse dongle, like a proprietary signal, it's like boom, instant. Like it works so fast, you know, you can do it in the BIOS. The BIOS works the wireless mouse of your computer. Mm -hmm. Are there any Bluetooth related projects you think we should build? Let us know. All right, so now we're gonna talk about RFID which is radio frequency identification. Um, so this particular wireless technology can go up to what, about like maybe 30 feet it can transmit? The expensive models, the yeah. most, most units are kind of almost Closer contact. Range. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you tell us about how this technology works? Um, there's two parts. There's a tag and a reader. The tag has um, a, pretty much just a number on it, and the reader will interpret that. There's two different types of tags. There's active tags and passive tags. An active tag will have a power source in it so that it will emit the signal, and a passive tag will take the signal, it'll use the wireless transmitted from the, uh, the reader mm -hmm. to power itself to spit back the um, signal. Some have a uh, small amount of RAM so they can send back more than just a number or a larger number. Now you can use these to, like you could register a tag to a database and then have information logged to say like a user or mm -hmm. like a specific tag yeah. so that you can use this swipe it and it'll spit back all of that information from the database, mm -hmm. right? And so that's one way it can be useful because that, I mean, linking just one small tag to infinite amounts of data in a, in a database can be extremely useful. Let's talk about some of the uses of RFID. Yeah! Uh, use one of these to get into my hackerspace. Um, when we first opened, we were broke, and so we had to use physical keys. And the downside of that is if we ever lost a member, we had to change the locks essentially to be able to make, r restrict access from those people that you know, didn't need access anymore. So what's nice about these is we can grant or restrict access remotely even. So uh, our administrators can go on their computer in our database and deactivate someone's tag. Or we've had times where our system wasn't working properly mm -hmm. and um, our admin was able to check remotely of like how many times it was swiping, whether it was act, like granting access and just the lock wasn't working or whether there was a, a fault with their tag um, and then determine whether he needed to just like fix something in the system or actually physically go there to fix the problem. So that's kind of cool. I have a friend that has an RFID tag injected into his hand. Mm. So uh, for those guys out there that don't like having things in their pockets, um, you can use it potentially to like, in theory, you could hook it up to start your car. If you've got a newer car, you could get it to register to that. Uh, you can use it for those auto pays. You can link into that. Mm -hmm. He uses it to get into his own hackerspace. Uh, I think if you had a smart house, you could link it so that you could swipe yourself into your own house. Let's, let's talk about some of the pros and cons of the uh, RFID tags. There are a lot of pros with RFID tags. You can implement hundreds, if not thousands of them in a single system and still have them be individually identifiable. Mm -hmm. uh, they're inexpensive. They're small. What about the cons? It's limited distance. A lot of them you have to be really close for it to work properly. Oh, you know, one of the, the, one of the cons is, and from a technical aspect, is that the uh, frequencies, there's such a wide range of frequencies mm -hmm. that not all the tags 
and the readers are compatible with each You're other? You're correct, yeah. Oh. Yeah, we have an entire bag of these that don't work with the style reader that we have, so oh. that was unfortunate. You really have to do your research to make sure that the frequencies match up between your reader and your tags. So that was a brief overview of RFID. If you have any suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. Karen, I couldn't help but overhear you and Felix talking about RFID. We were just talking about RFID. You know what's just like RFID? Uh, no, what is? NFC, only uh, kind of yeah. different, but yeah. similar. Yeah, NFC stands for near field communications. Oh. And the keyword being near. Yeah. You ever see those things where you can like, hey, I'm at the store, I want to Apple Pay. Uh, and you just go boop and you like touch your phone near yep. the thing. And so it's not really about touching your phone, it's just getting it close enough near, to the device. Near enough proximity. So yeah, that's near field communication. What do you think the range of that is? Um, I believe it's only like two to four inches. Oh wow, that's close. So I think, you know, part of it is be like, ooh, it's like, it's like more secure mm -hmm. because people can't intercept the signals. And also it's like, oh yeah, I'm touching my phone to make it work. Yeah. Because if your phone is in your pocket and it just like sucked your money out, mm -hmm. people might not be comfortable with that. But it's like, this is like consent. I like it. So the differences between RFIC and NFC is RFID is a passive tag where it's just a, a tag with a number attached to it and it can just be read. Yes. But NFC can essentially be two-way communication and the tags are active, so it could actually change the number and information that it's sending. Right. right? So if you had two phones that both had NFC and they were talking to each other, mm -hmm. they could exchange data. Yeah. So like let's say your phone, let's say your phone, you're gonna use it to pay for something, right? right? So your phone would act as the tag that's being read. And the kiosk, let's say this is the kiosk at mm -hmm. the store, it would look at your phone and say, hey, you know, give me your information tag. And the phone would be like, here's my information. But it's kind of like an active tag. The phone can change what information is on the tag. So it's kind of like emulating the tag. Cool. Whereas something like this RFID ring, which is like totally stylish. I like this. I'm totally gonna wear this as a thumb ring. You should, you should yeah. make it work on the Badri. Anyway, you know, this number can never change and will not be changed. Whereas, yeah, an NFC cell phone, it can work as the reader or the tag and go both ways. You know, actually one thing that's used in a lot are those Amiibo things. You know, they have oh, Amiibos. Oh yeah, and Skylanders, Skylanders Disney and Infinity. Disney Infinity. Amiibo's that's your favorite thing ever. Well, I guess if a company can make billions of dollars off elaborate Happy Meal toys, it's a good marketing Good play. for them. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the pros and cons. Okay, pros for NFC. Most cell phones have it. Mm -hmm. So if you enable it, you can talk to other people, and that's cool. It has two-way communication. Ah, yes, so it's not just like reading the information, you can share it, that's good. Negatives with NFC is you have to be really close, hence the near field communication. And even though most phones have it, that doesn't mean all phones have it, so you can't always assume. Yeah. It's kind of like on Walking Dead, where it's like, even though it is probably very likely your baby Shane, it ain't your baby Shane. Are there any cool projects you can think of that we could build using RFID or NFC? Let us know in the comments below. The next type of wireless protocols we're going to talk about are cellular protocols. Now this started with the original analog cell phone signals, AKA 1G, 1G yeah. first generation. Then we had 2G in the 90s, which is where it started going digital. Mm -hmm. Now 2G also allows you to download data, right? Yeah, that was 100 kilobits per second. 100 kilobits per second? That's not that much faster than a dial-up modem. Yeah, pretty crappy. If you remember, the original iPhone was 2G, also called the Edge Network. It's like if you have like one of those feature phones from the early 90s and you could go on the internet, it was actually using the Edge Network. The Edge. It was pretty slow. But then after that came the much vaunted 3G. Remember when 3G was in all the advertisements? Yeah, it was pretty amazing. That was the third generation. And that led to 4G, which they also call LTE. The long-term evolution. Yes, which is kind of the current standard that we have now that is always evolving. So what are the most common frequencies for cell phones? 800, 900, 1800, and 1900 megahertz. Okay, and that falls in the GSM mm -hmm. bands, which is the global system for... Mobile communications. Ah, that's what GSM stands for. I like to buy unlocked GSM phones, because mm -hmm. then you can just stick in a SIM card and then you can use it in other countries too. Useful. So you may recall about, what was it, 10 or 12 years ago, they turned off analog television broadcasts. Mm -hmm. I actually recorded, yes, I actually recorded the end of channel three here. I like filmed my TV, it went, it, yeah, it turned off like at noon hmm. one day. It was really weird, it was like, 
They played, you know that video they would play at the end of a broadcasting day with like the American flag and the national yeah. anthem? They played that, and then there was a weird glitch, and then just static. So then what the FCC did, the Federal Communications Commission, is they auctioned off all of the bandwidth that was freed up when we dumped analog television. Now, there's still broadcast television. It's just all digital. And by making it digital, they can compress it and get more channels in less space. So that extra space went to all the new things we have, and a lot of that is mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So that's one way they reclaim bandwidth because there's only so much bandwidth. You can't make new bandwidth so this may sound obvious, but what are some uses for cellular networks? Cell phones. Yes. What about data logging? Remote monitoring systems. Yeah. So unlike the other protocols we've talked about, in order to use the cell phone networks, you need to actually have a SIM card. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to get onto the system. But it's actually not that difficult. We have a lot of modules here where you just plug in a SIM card and you can connect to data. So basically, it's like a gateway to the internet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, SIM cards, you can get them anywhere. You can get them at Walmart or airports, or you can buy them off the internet. Yeah, a good network is Ting. Apparently they have some sort of a really nice tiered uh, service model. Ting does? Mm -hmm. This is what people use for experimentation. Yeah. So can you do voice over it, or is it just data? Voice and data. Uh, when we made the cell phone, remember when we made the cell phone for the show? Was That, mm -hmm. that was just 2G, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, it was on this module here. The Phono module yep. from Adafruit? And we used uh, Verizon. So could you describe these five modules to us? Okay, so... Uh, these modules, they're powered basically by the, uh, what is this, 3Com, or SimCom. Um, they're all different SimCom modules. This is a SSIM 900, and it's designed to go on a uh, Arduino. Arduino. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's got a microphone and speaker, so you can make this into a phone. What's next? <clears throat> this guy? Yep. Roop. This is the SIM 800. This was, this was the SIM 800L, and this is the SIM 808. Do you get more features with this? I think there's a little bit more features with that. But, now, is uh, this still 2G? I think, yeah, I think, yeah, that one's 2G. Okay. And this Are one... Are any of them 3G? Well, this one here is from Electro FCOM Pro. Mm-hmm. That's the, the SIM 900. It's still 2G. And this one, this mama jamba right here, is the SIM 5320A. And it is 3G. Ah, finally. I have yet to do anything with it. I would really love to do something with it. So what are the pros and cons of using cellular wireless technology? One pro is there's a high rate of data transfer. Mm -hmm. It can support uh, transferring large amounts of data, or video, for example. And it could be anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, you could use SIM cards. Yep. SIM cards are cheap and easy to use, and when you're done with it, just throw it away. Who cares? So what are the cons of using this? You have to buy a SIM yes, card, so it's a pro a, and a con. Got to have some kind of service. It seems like a lot of these uh, DIY modules use 2G, which is pretty old. Mm -hmm. That's what makes this one so great, because it's 3G. Any other cons? There may be some... Oh, yeah, the, the infrastructure required to, to support this, it, it's massive. you got to have uh, cell phone towers everywhere. But there are cell phone yeah, towers everywhere. Yeah, I know, but, but I mean, like... So the, the infrastructure is big for... The, that's, that's a con. Okay. Infrastructure requirements. So as long as you're in a developed area, there's going to be signal, but other places it might not work. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't use this to send something to the moon, unfortunately. That would also be out of XB's range. With all my new wireless knowledge, I feel like I don't need any of these wires anymore. But how are you going to charge your phone? Crap. <laughs> so this has been an essential series where we talk about certain topics in the electronics world. Let us know if there's any topics you'd like us to talk about in the future. We'd also like input on what sort of wireless projects and builds we can make in the future. Let us know on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash tbhs. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. The Super Duper Ultra Omega Time. <laughs> you mean this? Yes. So this was a straight wireless. <laughs> Too, which is uh, just a unit that uh, somebody gave to Benjamin Heckendorn when he was at a conference or something. <laughs> uh, Apple earphones look like, right? No, I'm not. I don't know anything about Apple. Never even heard of the company before. No, but really, I don't know. I've never seen these. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.